It's a little ironic that I would be giving this talk tonight in a courtroom, a venue which is almost wholly unfamiliar to the people who drove this financial crisis in this country, but here we are. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is speak with you about really three things. Hopefully briefly enough that we can engage in uh, a good round of questions. First of all, I am going to talk about the work of the commission, but tomorrow morning you're going to have the pleasure of hearing from Wendy Edelberg, who is our executive director, who's going to talk in detail about how we did our work, which had a lot to do with the substance of our review and the conclusions we came to. You'll also be hearing tomorrow from Chris Seifer, our chief investigator, and I just want to say I thought they did an extraordinary job for this country. And, uh, you know, they worked 15, 16, 17 hour days relentlessly for a year and a half. But I want to talk a little bit about our work and our findings. I want to talk about, secondly, where we stand today, three years after the crisis completely unfurled across this country and across the globe. It would be a mistake to say three years after the crisis because we find ourselves still in its grips today. And then finally, I'd like to make some remarks about where we need to go from here to move past this crisis so that we can not only rebuild but remake our financial system and economy so it is one that truly provides sustained growth, wealth, and opportunity for a broad swath of our society. Um, in starting tonight, I want to make a couple of personal observations about the journey that I undertook along with fellow commissioners and staff. When I accepted this appointment, and by the way, I was uh, deceived completely. I was told it would take about a third to one half of my time, and I think Wendy will tell you, even today in November, we're, we were a year ago, several weeks out from finishing our report, working 18 hours days. It was a, it was a full-scale commitment. But uh, when I accepted this appointment in July 2009, I did it with some belief that I had some reasonable understanding of the financial system of this country. After all, I'd been in the private sector for 20 years. As Bill mentioned, I'd been in real estate. I'd been in finance. I had on my own accord with my partners raised a billion dollars plus in equity and debt. I had been treasurer of the state of California for eight years, and I'd sat on the board of the two largest pension funds in America with $400 billion in assets. Uh, but I will tell you that this was a journey of extraordinary revelation. And along the way, I was surprised, I was fascinated, and I was deeply disturbed at what I learned. Uh, at times, I felt like I'd walked in my local community bank, I'd opened the wrong door, and I'd seen a room as big as the floor at the New York, New York casino. I had no sense of the level of gambling and risk that was being taken in our financial system. And I will tell you that unlike Claude Rains and Casablanca, I was truly shocked. The second thing I want to say is that um, for all my years in civic life, half of my career has been in the private sector, half in the public sector, but I'm not by any means a political naive. Uh, I had run four times statewide in the state of California. I had run for governor of the state of California. Um, I was taken aback at the raw exercise of power by the financial institutions of this country. I had no, I had some sense, but not a full sense of the extent to which they wielded an enormous power and the crudity with which they exercised that power. And I left Washington more concerned than ever about the sheer power of money as it affects decision making and public policy in our country. And the final thing I want to say on a personal note is we did much of our work, obviously, in Washington. We held hearings there. We held them in New York. But we also traveled to communities like Bakersfield, California, where unemployment's near 20 percent, foreclosures among the highest in the country. We went to my hometown of Sacramento, uh, which, again, has one of the highest foreclosure rates in the country, at an effective unemployment rate of 15 percent plus, Miami. And as we went across this country, we met hundreds of people whose aspirations had been crushed by what had occurred in this country. And uh, there was a real sense that coming out of this crisis, and we know this, I think, from academic work, that the climb out of a financial crisis is long, hard, and arduous, and there are millions of Americans who are questioning today whether they can climb out of the rubble created by this crisis. And there was this really fascinating dichotomy, if you looked in the wake of the crisis, 
between the lack of correlation, in a sense, between who drove this crisis and who has paid the price. It's as if a um, earthquake had hit and the uh, gleaming skyscrapers at the epicenter of that earthquake were left untouched and there was rubble strewn all over the place. So we did our work, as Bill said, with the hope that we could make some contribution to the body of knowledge that would lead this country to be less apt to go down once again the route of recklessness and risk that brought us to where we are today. Um, it's fair to say that this crisis is by no means over. As we gather here tonight, <clears throat> 24 million Americans are unemployed or underemployed, stop looking for work without hope of getting it. Uh, American households have lost $9 trillion in wealth since the onset of this crisis. Four million families have lost their homes to foreclosures, and the estimates are that that may go as high as 8 to 13 million before all of this is over. We haven't come out of the crisis, um, and the fact is, as I said, that the history of financial crises is they tend to last a decade. Now, it was important, as Bill said, for us to do our work in a way that we can impart to the American people a historical account of what happened. We were not charged with rendering recommendations about how to avoid the next crisis, but I think we are keenly aware of the fact that it was fundamentally important to write history accurately so that it could endure and the lessons could be learned. And so our role really, I think we, as we saw it, was to expose facts, to identify responsibility, to unravel myths, and it was our attempt in doing this report to record history, not to rewrite it, but also to do our level best to make sure it would not be rewritten. A little bit about our, our inquiry. Wendy will talk about it more tomorrow. We were charged by the Congress of the United States and by the law that President Obama signed with um, examining the causes of the financial and economic crisis that beset this nation. We were also called upon to examine the collapse of the major financial institutions that collapsed in this country or would have collapsed but for the extraordinary assistance given by the taxpayers of this country. And finally, we were asked uh, that if in the course of our work we came upon information that would let it lead us to believe that there were potential violations of law, that we were to refer those uh, cases to the Attorney General of the United States or other appropriate legal authorities, which in fact we did. In the course of our investigation, we examined millions of pages of documents. We interviewed over 700 witnesses. Uh, we held 19 days of public hearings throughout this country. Um, and as we began our work, so much of the uh, question in this country centered around whether or not the decision to bail out major financial institutions was the right decision. Whether we should have bailed out big, too big to fail institutions or not, and that debate still rages in this country today. But I think for us, the central question is not so much that, because that, in fact, was a fact of history. But the real question was for us to ask and answer this central question. How did it come to be that in the fall of 2008, the country appeared to face only two stark and painful choices? One was to allow the total collapse of our financial system, or alternatively, to inject trillions of dollars of taxpayer money into that system through two dozen various programs and still have nine million Americans lose their jobs, four million homeowners lose their homes, and have our economy left in tatters. Uh, in doing our work, as I said, our main focus was to write the historical record, and notwithstanding the political attacks that have been made on our conclusion, I think what I am proudest of, and I know that the people on the staff and the commissioners who adopted this report feel the same is we are now some 10 months after we released our report. And while there have been many assaults uh, from ideologues on this report, as of today, not one fact of this report has been successfully challenged from a point of accuracy. And in the end of the day, facts are very powerful. And this report is truthful in terms of what happened to this country in the years leading up to and during the crisis. But we were called upon to render our conclusions about main causes. And again, Wendy and I will talk about this some tomorrow, but let me at least briefly talk about the main findings of our report. First and foremost, we found that this crisis was avoidable. 
And I say that simply and clearly because the reigning narrative that emanated out of Washington and Wall Street at the time we began our work was that this was a collision of forces bigger than anyone. This was a, a perfect storm, something that could not have been avoided. A once in a lifetime extraordinary event. But in fact, as we looked at the facts, it's evident that all along the way there were warning signs and there was human action in inaction, not risk models gone awry that led to this crisis. And I must say bluntly that the CEOs of the major financial institutions and the public leaders who were the stewards of our financial system let us down and their miss was a big one, not a mere stumble. And for those who say no one could have seen it coming, let me just say loudly and clearly that all along the way there were flashing red lights and warning signs. One need only look at what was happening in the housing market the unsustainable rise in housing prices, the warnings from the FBI beginning in 2004 about a, an epidemic of mortgage fraud, which if it was left unchecked could leave the country with losses bigger than the savings and loan crisis, the widespread reports of predatory and egregious lending practices that began to metastasize in this country in the late 1990s, the dramatic growth of risky trading practices that converted many of our main financial institutions from institutions with, which lent capital for the building of enterprises to institutions largely focused on trading for their own account and taking big bets in the marketplace. And of course there was that very small matter of the creation of $13 trillion of mortgage securities and the doubling of mortgage debt in this country within one decade. Probably the prime example of the human and political and policy failures that led us into the abyss was what happened, or more, I think, accurately did not happen at the Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan. Uh, if you look at what happened to the Federal Reserve, uh, as early as 2001, the Federal Reserve was confronted with information about the nature of lending practices beginning to occur in this country. They had a debate at the Federal Reserve about curbing out-of-control subprime lending. At the end of that debate, they adopted a set of rules which they thought would control 38% of subprime lending in the marketplace. In fact, the rules were so weak that they controlled 1%. By 2005, there were all kinds of economists, pieces of information in front of the Federal Reserve, uh, laying out in stark detail what was happening in the mortgage markets. But even from that point on, it took a full year for the federal regulatory agencies to issue voluntary guidance warning banks about lending practices. And it wasn't until July of 2008, after the cake was baked, the economy was in full-fledged collapse, that the Federal Reserve finally adopted a rule that consumer advocates have been urging on them for a decade, which is you can't make a loan to someone who cannot afford to pay that loan back. When we queried Alan Greenspan about his tenure at the Federal Reserve, he commented that he had been 70% right and 30% wrong. Uh, to which I reflected the fact that the captain of the Titanic had been right 99% of the time and wrong only 1% of the time. When we queried him about why the Federal Reserve did not put in place tougher regulations to curb the erosion of mortgage lending standards, what he said is when you see unfair lending practices, what you need is not more regulation but more law enforcement. So we looked. And what we found is between 2000 and 2006, when our mortgage markets were radically transformed in this country, the Federal Reserve referred a whopping three cases to the Department of Justice for unfair lending. One related to a bank in Carpentersville, Illinois. One related to a bank in Victorville, California. And one related to the uh, New York branch of Society General. The fact is, the warning signs were there. Policymakers chose not to act. Secondly, and related to this chief finding of avoidability, was the dramatic and widespread failures in financial regulation. Not only the gaps that had grown up in our financial regulatory system as our financial markets had radically and dramatically evolved over the last 30 years, but the absence of regulators in using the authorities they had to curb excesses in the market. And of course, this phenomenon was in no small part due to 30 years of deregulatory ideology that had spanned both parties and ultimately had commanded the financial marketplace and financial public policy. There had come to be a belief that somehow 
The financial industry had learned to manage risks that the, such that you did not need the level of public oversight that previously existed. And that also somehow there was a correlation between the self-preservation instincts of financial institutions and the greater public interest. And we know today now that that was a deeply flawed ideology. So if you look at our report, you will see instance after instance where authority existed, but those charged with oversight did not act. The Securities and Exchange Commission had all the power in the world that they needed to curb the excesses at Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns, and they did not. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York, led by Tim Geithner at the time, had the ability to crack down on the excesses that were occurring in institutions like Citigroup, but it did not. And time and time again, we saw these failures that emanated out of this larger ideological shift. Thirdly, and again related to the failure of oversight, we saw dramatic breakdowns in corporate governance and reckless activities, knowing and unknowing, at major financial institutions, systemically important institutions in this country. And again, our report is replete with very dramatic examples of how large, systemically important institutions took outsized bets to the detriment of the larger financial system. When you look at our report, you can read about how at AIG, they took $80 billion of bets, credit default swaps on subprime mortgage securities. And at the time they did it, their CEO, who was paid $107 million, I think, over a short period of three years, their chief financial officer, their chief risk officer, none of the leading officials of that company had any idea, according to their sworn testimony, that they would be required to post collateral billions of dollars if, in fact, the market value of the subprime securities that they were backing began to decline. You'll read about how at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, how in 2005, 2006, 2007, being outcompeted, out hustled by Wall Street, who had commanded the subprime mortgage lending market, how they reversed course and began to dramatically pursue that marketplace in the quest of bigger market share, profits, and bonuses for their executives. And you'll read about how Merrill Lynch and Citigroup, these behemoth institutions, each of them took losses in 2007 of about $50 billion a year from bets and collateralized debt obligations that, again, their own management said of which they had no knowledge. Fourth, we found that throughout the whole financial system, there were levels of excessive borrowing and risk and leverage and a lack of transparency that ultimately led to this financial implosion. And I think central to that is a recognition that by 2008, our financial markets had dramatically transformed from the post-depression construct of a regulated system of commercial and bank institutions across this country. By the eve of the crisis, the shadow banking system, the lightly regulated, relatively opaque financial system had grown to $13 trillion in size, regular, bigger than our regular banking system. The leverage ratios at major financial institutions had hit 40 to 1 for every $1 of capital they were borrowing $40. At Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it was 75 to 1. So all it took was a 1 or a 2 or a 3% uh, decline in values for these institutions to be wiped out. And it's quite striking today, as we've read about the fall of MF Global, once again, how little has changed. Three years after the crisis, a major financial institution goes down with 40 to 1 leverage. Fifth, we found that, and this is related to our first finding about really the failure of policymakers to see the crisis coming, we found that as the crisis began to unfold in 2007, that the folks we most depended on, the Department of the Treasury under Hank Paulson, the Federal Reserve under Ben Bernanke, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York under Tim Geithner, were ill-prepared for this crisis. That their lack of knowledge about the financial system that they oversaw and the risks inherent in them crippled their ability to respond crisply and cleanly to the emerging crisis. We heard all through 2007 about how the crisis would be contained. And in fact, in June 2007, when one of the first explosions happens in the marketplace, a Bear Stearns hedge, Bear Stearns hedge fund heavily invested in subprime mortgage-backed securities blows up. The Federal Reserve, after a two-day meeting, walks away and says that what has happened there is relatively unique. 
It's only four weeks before the implosion at Lehman Brothers at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York even begins to ask the questions about who are the derivative counterparties to Lehman Brothers should they go down. The lack of knowledge about the evolving financial construct by our policymakers was truly appalling. And fifth and finally, in an area in which Bill Black is quite an expert, we sadly saw and documented systemic breaches of ethics and accountability at all levels in the run-up to the crisis. Lenders and mortgage brokers who deliberately steered borrowers into mortgages they could not afford. Firms like Countrywide that made loans that they knew that borrowers could not afford. Chris Seifer found a whole set of correspondence within Countrywide in which the CEO, Angelo Mazzillo, talks about these pay option arm loans, the negative amortizing loans, and refers to the possibility in, I believe, 2005 that these loans can bring financial and reputational catastrophe to their company, yet they kept on going. We saw the number of suspicious activity reports, which are reports of mortgage fraud, climb 20 times from 1996 to 2005, and then double again between 2005 and 2009, where the reports of about a trillion dollars in fraudulent loans made from 2005 to 2007 that left us with about $112 billion of losses directly attributable to fraud in the marketplace. And finally, we saw striking new evidence of major financial institutions that were buying loans, packaging them, selling them to investors, yet not disclosing the information they knew about how defective those loans were to the marketplace. We hope in our report that we have laid out accountability, responsibility, and again, I said, a clear history of what happened. In looking back, the question is, well, who caused this? Who's responsible? I will say this. I don't think it's fair to say that everyone was involved, nor were there a few bad actors. But it's very clear in the end that the chief responsibility must lie with the folks who led our public financial system and who were the CEOs and the leaders of the companies who helped lead our country over the financial abyss. I was talking to someone earlier tonight who was talking about the information we made available. And one thing I'd like to urge everyone to do or encourage everyone to do at some point or over a series of points is to go to the website we have because we tried to uh, create a legacy report here. It's not just our report, but also thousands of documents, hundreds of interviews that can be studied for years to come. And you can find that at fcic.law.stanford.edu. Uh, you can also just type in the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and get there. So the question is, given everything that has happened, where are we today? And let me make these observations. In many respects, uh, the financial system that occur, was in place before 2008 is in many respects largely unchanged, particularly with respect to the largest two big to fail institutions in this country. Most of the reforms which were enacted as part of the Dodd-Frank bill in 2010 have yet to be put into effect and there is a full-scale rearguard action taking place every day by the most powerful money interest in this country to stop the implementation of those reforms, which in many respects don't go as far as they need to go. Three years after the crash, we still don't have transparency and regulation of the $600 trillion over-the-counter derivatives market. We don't know today which American financial institutions are exposed to European debt and in what fashion. There are educated guesses of the exposure of American financial institutions may be between $150 and $700 billion. But thanks to Phil Graham and Larry Summers and others and the Commodities Future Modernization Act, these beautiful names in 2000, which derivatives were deregulated, still today we don't know the risk inherent in that market. The credit rating agencies, which were an essential cog in the wheel of financial destruction, are largely unchanged from before their crisis. There's a recent study out showing a clear correlation between how much they get paid for ratings and the nature of the ratings. Stunningly, and not so stunningly actually, municipal ratings or sovereign debt who pay the least tend to be rated the most harshly. 
corporations that pay the next amount tend to be rated less harshly, and structured products, which were the mortgage-backed securities that were at the center of this crisis, of course, pay the largest fee and are most generously rated. And the fact is that there is greater concentration of assets and power in fewer systemically important financial institutions than there were on the eve of the crisis. As of earlier this year, the top 10 U.S. banks controlled 77% of the banking assets in this country. Those banks last year, I might add, made $62 billion, and compensation at publicly traded Wall Street firms hit a record high of $135 billion in 2010. But notwithstanding this tremendous resistance to change, notwithstanding the extent risk still in the system, the Wall Street lobby, the financial sector lobby, is hard at work each and every day with 3,000 lobbyists on Capitol Hill at the regulatory agencies doing everything they can to stop reform. In the first quarter of this year, the major Wall Street firms spent $52 million in one quarter on lobbying, more than they spent when the Dodd-Frank bill was going through. There have been consistent efforts by congressional Republicans to slash the budget of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And by the way, this isn't a budgetary move because the Securities and Exchange Commission brings in more in fees than it spends on its entire budget. So cutting its budget doesn't save the U.S. Treasury one dime. There have been consistent efforts to slice away about a third of the budget of the Commodities Future Trading Commission that has this Herculean task of bringing the derivatives market into the open. And of course, 44 of 47 Senate Republicans have vowed to block any nominee to the position to head the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But as if there, that was not enough, there is now a full-scale counteroffensive underway to rewrite the history of the crisis. Alan Greenspan, who I think in many respects more than anyone led this nation down the path of financial disaster, recently blamed the slow recovery, the nature of our economy, not on the financial collapse which, uh, which we'd endured, but rather on, quote, he said, government activism is hampering what should be a broad-based, robust economic recovery. And he decried, ironically, the frenetic pace of new financial regulations and the current anything-goes regulatory ethos. And let me just say this is quite something. This is the man who drove us over the cliff, and now he offers us driving lessons. <laughs> and just the other day, someone you would think as learned as Michael Bloomberg spoke out about the cause of the crisis and laid it at the feet, surprise, surprise, of the Community Reinvestment Act, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the U.S. Congress. Either he's extraordinarily ignorant, or it is, again, part of a concerted effort to deflect attention away from the true causes of the crisis. And if you look at the statements of every major Republican candidate, they too are deflecting attention away from what drove this country into its current condition. So first of all, little change. Secondly, an active effort to rewrite history. Thirdly, crushing debt coming out of this crisis that is inhibiting our ability to lift off this economy again and get it to be productive and to see real growth in this country. We read each and every day about the debt loads that are crushing the economies of Greece and Spain and Italy, countries across the Atlantic. But here at home, our recovery is being crushed by the enormous amount of debt that was left behind by virtue of this crisis. Now, much of the center of public policy debate in this country has been about the long-term debt of this country, but let's not Let's not be unclear about why we have immediate deficits today. There was the small matter of two wars, two major tax cuts, and of the $1.4 trillion deficit that we have today, about a trillion dollars directly attributable to this crisis. And if you look at the history of financial crises, they are often uh, crises that bring on enormous private debt, then followed by public debt, part of which is to ameliorate the private debt. That in our country today, we have a crushing debt on working families in this country, and unless we deal with it, we cannot climb out of this, country, this, this recession. 
Today, 11 million families owe more on their mortgages than their homes are worth. Another 2.5 million families are on the cusp of owing more. In my home state of California, 36% of the homes with mortgages are underwater. In San Bernardino County, it's 54%. Nationwide, the negative equity of homeowners, middle class working Americans, is $700 billion. And in the state of Nevada, the aggregate amount of mortgage debt exceeds the value of homes on a statewide basis. And the fact is that the first wave of foreclosures in this country came from the extension of credit to people who probably should never have had credit extended to them on the terms that it was. The second wave came from those 9 million jobs that were lost. And the third wave of foreclosure that's going to keep our housing market in crisis are the tens of millions of people in this country who owe more on their mortgages and their homes and ultimately will begin to walk away as any rational economic decision maker would do. And finally, we're left with this in the wake of the crisis. Who would have thought that after what we've been through, we would come out of this crisis with greater and greater inequality of wealth and income in this country than before we went into it. Uh, yesterday I was in New York and I had the opportunity to visit Occupy Wall Street, notwithstanding all the comments about how disorganized those folks are, the young people are, how they have no message. Let me say two things. First of all, they're extraordinarily organized. They have a library, they've got a first aid station, their food station just got an A rating by the New York Santa Health Department. So it's apparently a pretty nicely functioning restaurant. But more than that, they do have a message. And it's pretty simple. And it's pretty clear. And that is there's enormous income inequality in this country that is going to cripple our productive capacity for years to come. As we gather here tonight, we've got the lowest ratio of wages to GDP since the Great Depression, the longest length of average unemployment since we started keeping records in 1948. Wages have been stagnant in this country now for 14 years. And one of the most striking pieces of data that I've seen recently is how, this, how uh, income growth is now being shared in this country. If you look back at past recessions and the recoveries, if you look in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s, you see as we climbed out of recessions, about half the growth tended to go to corporate profits. About half the growth tended to go to wages. As we came out of the dot-com crash, that shifted somewhat to about 70% of the growth as we climbed out of that recession going to corporate profits and about 15% to wages. Since the recovery, in quotes, officially started in May of 2009, 92% of this nation's income growth has gone to corporate profits and zero has gone to wages. So we stand today not just in the wake of a financial disruption, but we stand today at a place where we really do have to think about remaking, not just rebuilding our economy. Let me close with these thoughts. I went far too long, but I want to just make these observations and wrapping up. Where do we go from here? I think there are... Uh, I don't want to be like Rick Perry, you know, I think there are, uh, <laughs> oh, but I think there's two, no, maybe three things. I got four here. There are four things that we need to do. The first is the matter of justice. I made the joke today about being in a courtroom in which very few people who participate in this crisis have seen. It's probably the most often asked question I get. Why have there been no prosecutions? Why there's been no justice in the wake of this crisis? It's important that there be thorough investigations, and it's important that where there have been violations of law, there be vigorous prosecutions, not as a matter of vengeance, but to right wrongs. It's the American system of justice. It's important that it occur so that Americans have a sense that we have one justice system, not a dual justice system, one for people of wealth and power and one for everyone else. And it's critically important that there be vigorous investigations and prosecutions because of the simple matter of deterrence, making sure this does not happen again and that there are consequences for breaking the law. Time and time again, we've seen civil settlements where people settle for pennies on the dollar, with no admission of wrongdoing and a promise that they won't break the law again. And let me just submit to you for a moment that if someone dropped a 7-Eleven of $1,000 and 
could settle five days later for $25 with no admission of wrongdoing, I suspect they'd be back at it pretty darn quick. So this is not a matter of revenge. It's not a matter of cleaning up the books. It's about making sure this doesn't happen again. Secondly, the reforms that were enacted in 2010 have to be put in place, and in my view, they should just be the start of a larger reform effort to ensure we have a stable state financial system. Look, I come from a background of risk. I've been an entrepreneur. I've been a serial business builder. And the American capital system is about uh, taking risks, getting reward. There are failures in the marketplace. But the financial system is like the heart of our system. We want stability. And we certainly want stability among the two big to fail institutions for whom we pay the price when they fail. And this consistent rear guard action that's being undertaken by the moneyed interests of this country are exposing us to the next crisis, which is the subject of this conference. Third, we need debt relief in this country. And let me just say, if you look closely at public policy since the crisis erupted in the fall of 2008, almost every major public policy action that's been taken has been to protect lenders, 100%. Now look. For bad loans, for recklessness to occur, there are two parties. One is the lender who extends credit recklessly, and the second is the borrower who takes it. Except in many respects, the borrower is not being reckless, particularly if they're being given a free option. The speculator who can, on a no payment, no down payment uh, basis, get an option essentially to buy a home. But almost every policy effort that's being undertaken here and in Europe is to protect the lenders and the extension of credit. And the fact is there are enormous losses that are going to flow out of this financial crisis. They are going to be allocated. If they are allocated 100% to working people and businesses in this country, we will never see economic recovery. And specifically with respect to the matter of housing, the mortgages of all those homes that have been underwater, they've lost their value. They need to be written down. There needs to be principal reductions so we avoid the next wave of foreclosures and instability that will happen in this country if we do not do it. And finally, and most importantly, here's what I think we need to think about in the largest sense. If you look at what happened in our economy from 1980 to the eruption of this crisis, we saw a fundamental transformation. In 1980, 15% of the corporate profits in this country came from the financial sector. By 2003, that had reached 33%. The amount of financial debt in this country had soared. For every $100 in 1978 that was borrowed by non-financial companies, only $13 was borrowed by financial companies. By 2007, that ratio was $100 to $51. We became much more an economy about money making money, rampant speculation, than an economy that was deploying capital for the creation of wealth and enterprise and job creation. And that's our fundamental challenge. The center of our policy debate in this country should be how we remake this economy, how we deploy capital to create good wages and good jobs so we can have a broad-based recovery. When we do that, when we make the investments in education, and infrastructure, and technology, and renewable energy, and we take the high road of economic development, we will have a chance to emerge from this crisis. I want to thank you for asking me to be here tonight, and I look forward to tomorrow's session. Thank you very, very much. Okay, I talked too long. No time for questions. <laughs> okay. Hi. Yes. Very, very good job, and I thought it was very interesting. Two questions for you, actually. And can you identify yourself? Sure. I'm Josh. I'm a student from Rockhurst University across the street. Great. And my question is, for us who are in college right now, how do you see this catching up to us, like, 40 years down the road when we're, you know, going to retire or whatever? Do you see this really, like, spiraling into something bigger than what it is now? I'm sorry. Say, repeat that one more time. I'm sorry. So, like, we're, like, in college right now, but, you know, 40 years, we'll want to retire, 50 years. How do you see this spiraling if, if, we, don't if we don't regulate it more? Well, I mean, I, I do think there's a 
twin agenda here. I do believe that the financial sector needs kind of reasonable balance. What happened pre-2008 was in a sense like a, an athletic contest in which all the referees had been pulled off the field mm -hmm. and all the lines had been removed from the field also. So we want, I think, a steady state financial sector. But the real question, I think, for your generation it's kind of what's going to be the, the kind of the central driving force of our economic policy. The U.S. for the last 30 years really hasn't had a very focused economic strategy to create wealth in this country, to create good jobs, to ensure that there's a reasonable relationship between CEO pay, overall wages in this country. Look, I happen to believe there are many sectors in which we still can compete and win. The renewable energy sector is one where I think we can still hang in there and prevail. We invented a lot of the technology here. As of last year, we were still a uh, net exporter of solar panels. But having said that, in the last two years alone, China's gone from making 6% of the world's solar panels to 54%. They, their plan is not to come in number two. So I do think what's going to be required with people like you pushing it is for the U.S. to have a very focused policy to create jobs here at home, to deploy capital in ways that's much more productive than just trading and the creation of securities. So it's still an open question, but unless we get our productive capacity going again and deploy capital to do that, I do think the next 40 years will be very tough. And just quickly, do you think that credit card debt will cut, catch up with this country too? Because I know that's been a big problem lately. I think the overall levels, I mean, certainly, certainly mortgage debts there, student loan debts are a significant issue. Don't need to probably tell many of you that. And, you know, at some point, credit card debt, the, the debt load on working families is not insignificant. Hi, Marciana Ryan, the faculty of UMKC. Um, you mentioned MF Global, and I'm wondering, uh, in light of what's been reported in the press about John Corzine, former governor of New Jersey, senator, um, who apparently ignored regulators who wanted him to focus more on liquidity, went over people's heads, and there's now allegedly $600 million missing. Do you think that in light of what's gone on in the past couple of years, that there will be a more stringent effort to do some enforcement perhaps some individual criminal liability to send a message? Or do you think with all of his connections, uh, it's going to be more of the same? Well, I mean, obviously, I'm like everyone else here. I only read what I read in the papers. But as a, I guess as of this week, a significant amount of money is still missing. So I, I can't make any judgments about um, criminality or not from what I read at a distance. But I do think the MF Global, and by the way, not systemic institutions, they will rise and fall. But I do think it's quite remarkable to once again look at a financial institution that was levered up 40 to 1, the very kind of leverage ratios we had at Lehman and Bear. And I would hope in today's environment that there will be no kind of two tiers of justice. That's my personal hope. That, you know, everyone's entitled to their day in court fairly, but everyone should be treated equally in that respect. Yes. Sir, my name is Greg. I'm with Rutgers University as well. You had spoke a moment ago about the economy remaking itself, getting itself back on its feet. But you also spoke about China coming in, not wanting to come in number two. A lot of our jobs have went to China. A lot of these companies have shoved all this overseas. A lot of it has to do with wages in this country being out of control. Unions have, have sent some of these wages just astronomical and these companies can't afford to pay these wages. How do you see these companies coming back to the states, employing our people versus the Chinese people? I'm only smiling because sitting right behind you is an expert on this in terms of, uh, let, let me say a couple things. First of all, you know, Germany's a country that in many respects has defied this model of the low road. But, you know, they have decent wages for their people. They make high quality products. They actually have adopted a model of setting high standards and then building industries around meeting them. They have the toughest air pollution standards in Europe and they also lead in the production of air pollution equipment. In this country, uh, there are many uh, uh, industries right now renewable energy, but also to the extent, you know, I was disappointed, for example, that the 
uh, Obama administration did not adopt the new ozone rules because it would have created uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of job creation to produce the products and the services that would help reduce ozone layers. So, I, I mean, ozone levels. So, you know, my view is if you have a high standard economy, you can build industries around that. I would also like to think, and I don't want, I will be a dreamer here, that if we do get a carbon tax globally, and we're, we're the laggard nation in this respect, it will begin to argue for shorter supply lines. You know, we've got a lot of domestic um, industrial capacity here that, that goes unused. I, I just joined a board of a company in, um, it's based in Portland, Oregon. Now employs 250 people. Its supply chains are almost all the uh, aeronautics industry and the automotive industry, so it's a, it's a largely American supply chain. And the company makes a five kilowatt fuel cell that produces levelized cost of energy for nine cents a kilowatt hour for electricity and heat. So it produces electricity and power for less than you can get off the grid. It reduces carbon emissions by 40%. It has no, uh, there's six other kind of main emissions, SOX, NOx, VOCs, untraceable levels of them. Good paying jobs, engineers, high level manufacturing. I happen to think that if America wants to, it can p compete on that plane. But it's not. But it's not going to be easy. Next. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. With the, with the mic, please. My name is you Dick. Didn't need a mic. <laughs> My name is Dick Mitchell. I'm retired from NESD FINRA, and I had uh, two questions regarding criminality. Number one, do you know what the current status is of the criminal referrals by the commission? And number two, you had mentioned earlier about the Bear Stern hedge funds. As far as I know, the two principals behind that uh, have very uh, egregious allegations made against him, yet they were acquitted. And doesn't that really, isn't that really going to discourage even more prosecutions from occurring in the future? So Bill's probably the expert on this, but let me say, to the first question, let me say this. I'm now a private citizen, so I'm not privy to the information that we refer to the Department of Justice. My hope is that whatever we referred, whatever uh, Senator Levin's subcommittee referred, that those matters are taken seriously. And just generically, uh, I would hope, given the breadth of what's happened, that the resources are put on these cases, not just the referrals we made. But I can't give you the status because I don't, you know, once we went out of existence, we became private citizens again. In terms of the uh, prosecutions you talked about, you're right. Those two individuals were acquitted. That's our justice system. They were tried, they were acquitted, but just, you know, A, two prosecutions and two acquittals does not make a comprehensive law enforcement set of actions. I mean, I think Bill will tell you, and maybe you know this, but. In the wake of the savings and loan crisis, there was a very different result. Over a thousand prosecutions, felony prosecutions of executives at SNLs. And part of that was, and I think as Bill can tell you, is because regulators were actively involved with law enforcement officials in referring cases, and as Bill Black would tell you, being the Sherpas for those cases to help uh, law enforcement understand the intricacies of financial law, and it's not clear that that's happened this time around. Is that a fair statement, Bill? Yes. Uh, my name is David Tancor, and I'm a, a graduate of the University of Kansas City, and I'm a retired staff member of the University of Missouri at Kansas City. My question is, how can anyone be optimistic that we're going to curtail the power of the corporations in the United States when we have a president who doesn't stand up to them, when they have tremendous influence on too many members of Congress, and they even have the Supreme Court making decisions in their favor. Well, let me actually reverse those, because structurally we've got a problem. I mean, first of all, right after the Watergate reforms, there was the buckley Vallejo decision in which the court said, yeah, you can have limits on campaign contributions, but they don't apply to a wealthy person's ability to put their own money. Now, just as a matter of personal experience, I became the Democratic nominee for governor of California, and I was able to raise $37 million from about 30,000 people and barely warded off a challenge from an individual who spent $42 million of his own money. 
it, the power of money in the system is enormous. And of course, the courts made it worse with the Citizen United. The equation of money and free speech has been enormously damaging to our democracy. I would like to tell you I have a simple answer. I'd like to turn to my three daughters and say, you know what? Uh, we can do this. But the task of people organizing en masse, uh, voting and organizing on behalf of their own interests is enormously difficult today. Uh, but I want people to keep in mind that we are still a nation of 300 million people where we have the franchise, we have the ability to stand up, and you know voters need to do it. Now I actually happen to think that Occupy, the phenomenon, the, I take heart in this respect. So I went to Occupy Wall Street, they're a quote unquote a ragtag group. First of all, I was not only impressed with their organization, but extraordinarily impressed with the young people who showed me around. But the fact that a majority of Americans say they support them, I think is quite remarkable. So I haven't by any means given up hope. But the playing field is tough. Now, I would like to think, though, just going back in history, that when Roosevelt was president, you know, the, the tilt of wealth and power was enormous then also. And you're right, he, con he confronted it very directly. But um, it is not to be underestimated, and it's probably the greatest single challenge we face today. And there's this illusion still that American corporations are American corporations. No, they're multinational corporations without necessarily having loyalty. This is not across the broad band, because there's a lot of companies here who employ locally, whose markets are local, but there's also a broad band of corporations who really have no loyalty to this as a nation. They just happen to be headquartered here, have benefited from the enormous investments we've made in the talents of our people. But it is not under, and that, that is not to be underestimated. It's one of the things I said for all my years in political life. I was really kind of taken aback and shocked at the level of power and the crude exercise of, by the financial industry. But always hope. Okay. Well, I, one more. One more? One more. Right. You know what? When I ran for governor, that always the last question. The staff would always say, Time to go. I said, I'll take one more. And it was invariably death penalty or illegal immigration. <laughs> <laughs> or a reporter saying, about that contribution. No, go ahead. I'd like to focus on the concept of too big to fail. I worked in the SNL bailout process, and following it was a period of great consolidation in the SNL industry. We are seeing that again now in the banking industry. The argument I hear made by some of my colleagues is that if we were to break up Citigroup or B of A, that we would then be at a disadvantage in the global marketplace because we wouldn't have institutions big enough to play. Could you comment? I don't, I don't think I'd buy the argument. I mean, I, I mean, there's degrees of this. I guess who are we get, who are we worried about the French banks that hold all the sovereign debt? Um, yeah, but not to be glib about it, most large lending facilities are syndicated in any event. One of the things that struck me from the work of Chris and his whole investigative team is how many times you had people sitting atop these big institutions who really didn't have the capacity to see everything that was going on. You know, Chuck Prince, who was the head of Citigroup. When he was talking about their, uh, they, they took about $50 billion of losses, largely attributable to their CDO business. And you know, his comment was, if someone told me we had a $40 billion position, it wouldn't have gotten my attention. I do think there's a problem with scale. And the fact is that while you know, the statutes say that there's no longer to be any direct assistance to a large financial institution, the pressure to save those large financial institutions will be enormous if there's another crisis. I have a, just a little poll here. How many folks have their money in a one of the largest institutions versus, and how, let me start the other way. How many have them in a credit union or a community bank? How many of them have in one of the big four, big five, big six? For what it's worth, I'll just give you one little piece of personal background. I was in real estate development investment and my own personal experience from 89 to 93, when, as you know, there was a virtual real estate depression in California and other places, is um, all the community banks tended, I was kind of a you know, small, mid-sized business person. All the community banks worked with us. They got paid off 100% in full, but we were their market. 
they actually kind of cared about community, cared about client, because that was their franchise. If their community didn't make it, they really didn't have a marketplace. The big institutions, we were just a numbered loan, you know, with, and, and in the end of the day, they were very rough. They didn't come out as well. The local institutions actually took a lot more time to try to work out problems. And I think one of the things we all ought to be concerned about is kind of the, the, the disappearance of the smaller institutions in this country. Um, it's hard for them competitively now. They borrow at more expensive rates than the biggest institutions because the presumption is the biggest institutions will be saved. But uh, I think one of the most uh, heartening, optimistic things that's happened recently is Bank Transfer Day, where thousands, tens of thousands of people began moving their money back to community-based institutions. And that's something you can do on your own. And I would urge people to think about doing that. Thank you all very much.